Are you living as a victim of this cruel world? Or are you living as a victor through the work of Christ? Do you live with fear and dread? Or do you live in peace and joy? Are you a victim or are you a victor? Because loved ones, we have victory in Jesus. That's what I want to talk with you this morning. The title of the message is simply Victory in Jesus. Jesus told us in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. What does that mean that he has overcome? Clearly, he did not mean that we would expect a life free of pain and suffering, sickness or illness. What did Jesus mean when he said, I've overcome the world? That's what we want to talk about today. The victory we have in Jesus. As we continue in 1 Corinthians 15, we are going to conclude this amazing chapter uh, dealing first with the resurrection of Christ, but moving into the resurrection of all those who call on the name of the Lord, and now uh, climaxing into this great celebration of the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. And it will be our goal that as we learn of the great victory that we have in Christ, that we will come to a point of celebration, come to the Lord's table celebrating through the ordinance of communion, the victory we have in Jesus. So what does it mean that we have victory? The original word in the Greek is simply Nike. Now whether or not you like the shoe, that Greek word means victory. Jesus said, He has overcome, that he has victory. What we're going to look at is what that means for us. Victory over sin and victory over death. So let's take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We will pick up where we left off last week, God willing. And we're going to make our way through uh, the end of this uh, vital chapter. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15 we're going to start in verse 50. And as you are able, would you stand with me for a simple demonstration of respect for the reading of God's holy written and errant word. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will raise, be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you. We thank you that we can stand 
victorious, not because of anything that we have done, but solely because of the work of Christ Jesus. And through our faith in him, Lord, we know that we have victory. Now, Lord, I just pray that we'd better understand all that we have to celebrate in this great salvation we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And amen. Thank you. you may be seated. This chapter really culminates in victory. It started by answering a couple of questions, talking about resurrection and how our body could be raised and how that because of the resurrection of Christ, we have both an understanding of the reality of resurrection and the priority of resurrection. And so we have come through this chapter getting to the point where it really sinks into application. But if you're taking notes this morning, there's one main idea I want you to get from the message this morning. And I wrote it down this way. We can rejoice in our salvation until our Savior returns. We can rejoice in the salvation we have in Christ. Because in Christ, we have victory. It doesn't mean that this life is going to do everything like what we would want. It doesn't mean that everything that we have in this life is going to be good. But what it does mean is that Jesus Christ has overcome this world. He has been raised victorious. And we can celebrate that victory we have in him until he comes for us. Now that being said, there are two principles in this passage that explain why we should rejoice in our salvation. And then there is a third principle that really explains how we rejoice during this celebration that we have. But first, look, if you will, again, back in the text, starting in verse 50, where we see this first principle. He says again, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This is reviewing what he's already said, uh, that we cannot in this body expect that we will be in God's presence. But he says, do not worry. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. But behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. Now this first principle of why we Rejoice in this salvation is based upon what is to come. Now, the first thing this text reminds us of in verse 50 is simply that we're not going to be able to spend eternity with God with these bodies. They are, imper they are perishable, but the life to come is imperishable. So, what we can celebrate is the remembrance that we are going to be changed. I wrote this down as the first principle. We should expect our effective transformation. We should expect our effective transformation. Now, it's interesting to me that this passage looks at the resurrection of the saints from the opposite perspective, if you will, from that in the book of Thess 1 Thessalonians. Remember, if you were with us when we studied Paul's letters to the church of Thessalonica, they were so excited about the second coming that they started getting really discouraged because some of the believers had already passed away. So their question was, what about those who have already died? Are they going to miss out on the second coming? What did Paul say in that letter to the Thessalonians? No. Those who have fallen asleep 
will proceed. And again, he uses the euphemism of sleep, referring to those who have died in Christ. He said, they will be raised first, then we who are left will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this is the opposite perspective. They are not so much concerned about those who have passed away. He's not saying, well, what about those who've already died? But it's the opposite. It's about if we're going to be changed, we must first die, and then the Lord resurrects us. And the question is, what about those who are still alive when Jesus returns? And what does Paul say to that question? Well, first he's like, guys, yeah, Jesus is going to return, but that's not a problem if you're still in this body because he's going to change us. He's going to change us, and that change will be radical. We will be changed from this life for a body that will last forever in the next life. Now, that being said, the first principle that we really, the first point I want to make under this principle, if you look at verse 51, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. What does it mean when Paul says mystery, the Greek word mysterion? What does it mean that he's telling us a mystery? Yeah, normally it would mean something that was hidden before now being revealed. In other words, in the Old Testament, it does not necessarily refer to us being changed in the twinkling of an eye that we're going to be immediately translated, if you will, into heaven. But Paul is telling us to let us know what it's going to be like. And then the other aspect of this mysterion is it's okay if you don't understand everything. Is anybody all right with that? Okay, good. That when it comes to the last things, what we would call eschatology, the study of things, the last things, there are going to be questions that we don't have answers to. So if someone asks you a question, what do you say? That's a mystery. And that's okay. So we don't necessarily know everything, but one thing that we do know is that Jesus is coming back. And when he does, that's a good thing. So the first thing I wrote down under the first principle, letter A, the return of the Savior is inevitable. He will come back. That's what he told us. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And we, we have questions. Well, does that mean that the Lord is going to return first with the secret rapture of the church and then there's going to be the tribulation? Or is the tribulation going to start and then there's going to be a rapture? Or what's going to happen? It's a mystery. And we're not going to be able to understand all of it, and that's okay. But what we do know is that we can expect that we are going to be transformed. Even if we are alive. You say, what what about someone that has already gone off to be with the Lord? Well, they are not going to proceed. They will precede us. We will not precede them. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, to be absent from the body is to be where? Present with the Lord. So their spirits or their soul are already in heaven. But the bodies will be raised again. And then if we're still around when the Lord returns... We will be changed. That is inevitable. Now, if you look again in the text, there's another important point from this in verse 42, or excuse me, 52 and 53. It says, we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet. Now, what is he telling us here? 
Some would say, you see where it says last trumpet? They would look to the book of Revelations through Revelations 8 through 11. It talks about seven trumpets that happened somewhat in the middle of the tribulation. And so the last trumpet, they'd say, see, that's the seventh trumpet, which means we will be raptured right in the middle of the tribulation. Is that what he meant by the last trumpet? It's a mystery. <laughs> you know, we don't fully know. If you are a mid-trib, you would say, well, yeah, he's talking about the seventh trumpet there. But he's just talking about the last trumpet that's going to happen while we, as believers, the church is on earth. Doesn't mean there will never be a trumpet ever beyond that. Uh, some of you might be playing trumpet in heaven, and that's good, right? But this is what the Bible says. The resurrection of the saints will be immediate. And you can write that down for point B under principle number one. When it says, and uh, look back in the text, and I want to show you what this says. It says, in a moment. That is the Greek word atomos. Adam which according to Greek thought was the smallest possible piece of matter that could exist. They believed that an atom, an atom was indivisible. So the Greek term in atomos would be in an instant, very, very quick. Now we're not speaking scientifically. The Greeks did not realize that eventually somebody would figure out how to split an atom. But uh, nevertheless... Paul goes on to say, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Some translations say blinking of an eye, but it's much, much faster than that. Literally talking about the speed in which it takes for you to observe the twinkling of like a star. So it'd be like the speed that it takes for light to go from the front of your eye to the back of your eye. How fast is that? That's pretty fast. Point being, as we can say, immediate. It is not going to be a slow transition, but if you blink, you're going to miss it by a long shot. But the point being is that we're going to be transformed, and that shouldn't be something that we should fear. But that is good news about the victory we have in Christ. Because if you have a body that is not working like, you should, like it should... If you have things that are going on with you physically, it is an absolute promise that we will have a new body in the next life. And I'm thankful for that. But there's another reason to celebrate, starting in verse 54. In verse 54, he goes on to say, When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality... Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then Paul, uh, quoting from Hosea chapter 13, we'll look at later. O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? He's like taunting this picture of death. You know, the grim reaper that everybody talks about being the one constant in life. Yeah. Jesus already whipped that guy. So we don't have to worry. So here's the second principle. We will experience our eternal triumph. The victory has already been won. But we haven't fully realized it until the next life. Jesus has already risen victorious as the first fruit of that which is to come, as the prototype of what our resurrection will be like. But we haven't fully realized that because we're still in these bodies, still on this earth. But we can look forward and we can celebrate because of the triumph that we will experience. And there's a couple things about that triumph that I want to look at quickly if you look at verse 55, he's specifically saying, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
What does he mean by that? I can remember it was a few years ago, there was a honeybee. And I don't know why this little honeybee was sitting on my uh, lawnmower, but it was sitting on the seat of the riding lawnmower. So when I sat down on the seat, not realizing there was a honeybee there, when I leaned against it, guess what it did? Yeah. But an interesting thing took place. It now was an opportunity for me to take this honeybee and show my kids. Because I wanted to show them. I said, here, look, this is a bee. And, and my son came up to me and said, Daddy, will it sting me? I said, no. This bee will never sting you. Because it already stung me. And it's not going to do any stinging. Death, when death grappled with Christ, death put its stinger, if you will, into Christ. And Christ rose victorious. And death has no sting. Jesus Christ took the sting for us so that death no longer has a sting. I wrote it down this way under Point number, principle number two, death is now powerless over us. In the same way, a honeybee can only sting once. Now, don't try that with a hornet or a wasp. Man, them guys can sting you till, yeah, it, it's a little different. But if it is a honeybee, they can only sting once. And once they sting, that's it. And once death went to war with Christ. Christ won. And death has no power over us. Again, Paul is quoting back from the book Hosea. Hosea 13, 14. You can look that up later if you'd like. But it's just basically referring to an illusion, if you will, of what Christ would do. Now, this is an example that you see in John 11. In John 11, uh, Jesus is, is going to visit Lazarus. And Lazarus has already died, you remember. And Martha comes out to Lazarus and said, Lord, if you'd been here, comes out to Jesus. Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. What did Jesus say to Martha? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. And even though death may come, they will live forever. See, for believers, sin is the problem. And, and we'll look at how sin is really the sting of death. But sin has been taken care of because of Christ. Jesus Christ went to the cross not because he did anything wrong. He was not held to this tree by nails, but he was held to love. And the love held him there because he wanted to pay for our sin. And he did. Meaning that not only is death powerless, but sin has been paid for. And you can write that down for letter B under principle number two. Our debt has now been paid for us. See, the sting of death is sin. Now, what does Paul mean when he says in verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. What does he mean by that? How is the law empowering sin? Well, Paul talked about this in the book of Romans some. He was saying specifically, how would we know sin unless the law told us do not sin? Now he's not necessarily speaking just of the Mosaic law, but the Bible tells us that there is a law written on our heart where our conscience bears witness, so that we are all without excuse. But Paul is simply saying, we wouldn't even have knowledge of sin if it wasn't for the law telling us what is wrong. But once we know what is wrong, that, in effect, empowers that sin to have victory over us. Unless we choose Jesus. Because, loved ones, when we put our faith in Christ, all of our sin, past, present, and future is forgiven. Our debt has now been paid. 
Have you ever had someone pay a debt for you? Maybe someone bought you a cup of coffee or maybe they paid for your meal for you and you're like, okay, I'd like to pay. Give me the check. You're like, no, somebody already paid this for you. How does that make you feel? What does it make you feel when you realize all of your sin has been paid for by Christ? Does that make you want to stand up and shout hallelujah? Because that's what we're celebrating. It's the fact that we have been given victory over sin and over death. That's what Jesus means. Yes, this life will still have some pain and some suffering, but death, that cannot defeat us. Sin, it's been paid for. We will have triumph over all eternity. And that's the reason why we celebrate. Now, as we continue in this text, we talked two reasons why we should celebrate. We should expect our effective transformation and we will experience our eternal triumph. But now as we get to verse 57, he's now moving to the how. How do we celebrate? How do we rejoice in our salvation until the return of our Savior? He says, do what? Thanks be to God. So if we are going to rejoice in our salvation, how do we rejoice? Thanks be to God. I wrote it down this way. Third principle. We must extend our enthusiastic thanksgiving. We need to be able to come and tell God, thank you. That is a celebration for us. Now, wouldn't it be great? Follow me on this. Wouldn't it be great if God gave us specific instructions by which we would regularly come together and thank him through through the observance of uh, maybe an ordinance like, I know, if we could take an analog of the body and the blood of Christ and we could celebrate together in a, a means of thanksgiving, wouldn't that be something that would be special for us? That we could gather together as believers and we could come to the table and we could say, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. That's really what this is all about. We celebrate the victory we have in Christ through coming to the table to remember what Jesus has done for us so we can simply say, thank you. And there are two elements to that which most of you know. First, we celebrate the body that was given. In Luke chapter 22... Verse 19, Jesus is uh, in the upper room with his disciples, and this is where he institutes the Lord's Supper. And he says, he took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So loved ones, what we do is we remind ourselves that Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven And he took on human flesh. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. We celebrate, we remember the body of Christ as we take bread together. And as we eat the bread together, we remember that Jesus Christ's work is taken upon each of us by grace through faith. But then also we take the cup. And what does the cup celebrate? You can write that down. We celebrate the blood that was shed. See, we have victory 
because of what Jesus did for us. He stepped out of heaven, became a man, and then being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus institutes that taking the third cup of what was the Passover meal, the cup of redemption. He said, and likewise, the cup after they had eaten, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So loved ones, how we celebrate Christ is that we get to come to this table and we get to say, thank you, God, for what you did for me. In just a moment, that's what we're going to do together. But loved ones, uh, the Bible tells us that we need to come ready for this table. We need to come in a worthy manner. Because the Bible says if we come to this table in an unworthy manner, we're guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. Therefore, let an individual examine themselves. And then so let them eat. We'll talk about that more in just a second. But let's review the main idea that we're trying to understand is we can rejoice in our salvation until our Savior returns. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it for two reasons. And if you look again, it says we should expect our effective transformation. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but we will be changed. So first, letter A, the return of our Savior is in. Evitable. And then second, the resurrection of the saints will be immediate. Second principle, we will experience our eternal triumph. Death is now powerless over us. And our debt has now been paid for us. Third principle, talking about how we must extend our enthusiastic thanksgiving. We celebrate the body that was given and we celebrate the blood that was shed. In 1 Corinthians 11, it tells us, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine themselves. Then let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats or drinks discerning the, without discerning the Lord's body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So the question would certainly be, how do I come to this table in a worthy manner? How could I ever come to celebrate what Christ has done for me? Because None of us are really going to measure up to that. I know I don't. So after Paul explaining all of this great victory from 1 Corinthians 15.1 all the way to 1 Corinthians 15.57, he explains this great victory. But then there's verse 58. Verse 58 starts with the therefore. And anytime you see a therefore, you look to see what it's there for. Therefore, it's like a, a door swinging on a hinge. He says, because of the victory we have in Christ, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, tells us what? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So one of the things that we could do in preparing for this table is to make sure that we have two qualities. The first of which is what? We need to be steadfast. We need to be immovable. So that means you need to be hard-headed, right? What does it mean to be steadfast and immovable? Steadfast and immovable in what? Yeah, he's, he's saying steadfast, immovable, but it doesn't tell us in what, but it's certainly understood in the victory that we have, in the knowledge of the victory that we have. I wrote it down this way. First concluding point, 
I must stand firm in the gospel of Christ. Loved ones, this for some people might be the first time you've heard the gospel. The fact that Jesus Christ died for you. More than likely, it's not the first time you've ever heard. But if it was, can you imagine what that would be like? To hear the gospel fresh, that there's a God that loves you enough to step out of heaven, become a man, and die for our sin. We need to be acquainted with that gospel. We need to be steadfast, immovable in that gospel. That is, we need to remind ourselves of the great goodness we have in this life. We should not just take it for granted that we've been given victory. That's what Paul was saying. Be steadfast, immovable in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith and for faith. That is as it is written the righteous shall live by faith. So loved ones, are you firm, standing firm, immovable in the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's where we need to be first before we come to this table. That we are fully aware of what Jesus has done for us and that we're not taking that for granted. But then he says, steadfast, immovable, look back to verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So first he says, you need to stop and stay put. But then he says, keep working. And he's not, he's not really contradicting himself. He's saying, stay, stand firm in the gospel of Christ. That we need to be reminded of the fact that Jesus Christ died for us. But then he says, we need to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. What does he mean by that? What is the work of the Lord? Yeah, making disciples is what we've been commanded to do. That would be reaching people and teaching people for Christ. And I wrote it down this way. This is your second concluding point. I've been sent out with the gospel of Christ. We have all been sent out with the gospel of Christ. So the second way in which we can make sure that we are ready for this table is we need to make sure that we are living for Jesus. Not that we are in the secret service and no one knows that we're followers of Christ, but that we're living for Christ. Not that we're cramming it down everybody's throat, but the fact is that we are living for Jesus Christ and people know it. So as we close, are you standing firm in the gospel of Christ? Have you been sent out with the gospel of Christ? Well, loved ones, you can't change the past, but you can make a decision to change the future. And as we get ready to come to this table, I want to encourage you to make sure everything's right between you and the Lord. Loved ones, you do not have to be a member of this church to celebrate communion with us this morning, but you do need to be a child of God, and you do need to take time to make sure that you're ready. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this sacred opportunity we have to come to this table. Lord, we choose to take this time to celebrate the victory we have in you. But Lord, before we come to this table, you ask us to examine ourselves. So Father, I do ask that you would search me, O oh God, and know my heart that you would try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me 
and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, as we look inward, we pray that we would be able to come to your table in a worthy manner. This we pray in Christ's name. And God's people said, 